very good evening uh, pravin for your kind introduction and uh, very good evening my dear uh, professional colleagues and uh, i am dr sepuri krishnamohan endocrinologist at my own center sepuri diabetes and endocrine center karnool and uh, uh, today's agenda just will be divided into four parts actually first my talk followed by ma'am's talk and then we'll have a real case scenario and one case i'll present ma'am will present the second case and we'll have a small discussion and uh, last one the fourth one will be always uh, question and answer session so i would like to request all the participants and my dear professional colleagues uh, to type your queries or questions in the chat box uh, so that we'll take up all the questions at the end of the session and with that uh, i i thank uh, uh, dr praveen and uh, his team uh, the nonadis for giving me an opportunity to be the speaker of this evening and uh, today we are going to talk something about the insulin management in the in the critical and the non critical care setup in the hospital settings and uh, today i am going to talk about uh, the topic being uh, embracing the basal and bosal therapy So, sorry the basal and the bolus therapy to manage hyperglycemia in non critical case setup pravin would you mind uh, moving the slides yeah please next slide please illra no illu rest fellow no Next slide. Yeah, I have to maximize this. Okay. Yeah, please next slide, please. Yeah, this is my financial disclosure. Next slide, please. Yeah, today's agenda is be divided into three parts. The first part being uh, the burden, implications, and barriers to the optimal control. and second one being the principles of management and the third one uh, the basal bolus therapy as the right choice next slide please yeah now this slide shows us the the classification of hyperglycemia in hospital and uh, if you see on the left hand side uh, the it is it says uh, the first column says uh, the previously diagnosed cases of di diabetes and uh, the existing hyperglycemia prior to hospitalization and when it comes to the second column it is previously undiagnosed and at the time of admission if you find uh, the fasting plasma glucose around or more than 126 mg per dl or the the random blood glucose or the the, the newer term for this is uh, the casual plasma glucose that is cpg if it is around or more than 200 mg per dl or the glycosylated hemoglobin the hba1c around or more than 6.5% you can just label it as uh, the, the the diabetes either the type 1 diabetes or the type 2 diabetes most of the times uh, we miss the diagnosis of uh, type 2 diabetes but never we miss the diagnosis uh, of type 1 even before admission it is manifested very early so because it is early in onset and, and very acute uh, uh, condition where we can uh, diagnose it uh, before the admission so this this thing the, the fasting plasma glucose are the the casual plasma glucose are the hba1c and they have missed one more here i just have to put it as uh, the oral glucose tolerance test the ogtt with uh, 75 grams of anhydrous glucose mixed in 200 ml of water given over 10 10 minutes and uh, if you measure uh, the 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 two hour uh, post glucose uh, 75 grams uh, post glucose if it is around 200 or more than 200 uh, it is diagnostic of type 2 diabetes mellitus and these are the four parameters so but we don't do this ogtt very routinely in only when there is a suspicion when there is a doubt that the patient is in igt then we advocate it that is done in unequivocal cases only and uh, coming to the last column that is stress hyperglycemia 
and uh, what is divine by stress hyperglycemia so when the patient is un under acute stress uh, like maybe the infections maybe the sepsis like take the covid pandemic uh, see most of the patients are diagnosed uh, even earlier they were not uh, diagnosed as the type 2 diabetes and uh, at the time of admission the, the covid uh, uh, infection because of the stress they have and because per se the the the, the uh, covid virus induces this particular uh, the new onset uh, 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 acute hyperglycemia or the new onset uh, type 2 diabetes and maybe because of the drugs already the patient might have used uh, some sort of steroids so then also it is like uh, it shows uh, the little bit elevated blood glucose levels this is called stress hyperglycemia which is a temporary phenomena most of the times uh, they become normoglycemic and at the time of admission if the uh, no it is wrong da no, like okay if the time of admission uh, the hba1c is is more than 6.5% it is not 5.7 and, and during 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 hospitalization yeah, at the time of admission the yeah, glycosylated hemoglobin less than 5.7% and during hospitalization the fasting plasma glucose more than or around 126 mg per deciliter or the casual plasma glucose around or more than 200 mg per deciliter and post discharge most of them will be normoglycemic and some of the cases of covid they proceed on to the condition called the new onset type 2 diabetes mellitus next slide please yeah this 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 table summarizes the factors leading to hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia on the left hand side you can see the factors the, the, that uh, the lead to this particular hyperglycemia on the on the right hand side you find the hypoglycemia and uh, the factors which predispose to hyperglycemia release of stress hormones there is uh, the, the stress hormones are otherwise known as the counter regulatory hormones whereas uh, insulin is called the regulatory hormone whereas these the counter regulatory hormones are otherwise known as the stress hormones uh, they are adrenaline noradrenaline cortisol and uh, growth hormone and the thyroid hormone and the glucagon these six are categorized as the counter regulatory hormones whereas the the insulin remains the the regulatory hormone the body maintains an equilibrium a homeostasis in between these two things it's something like a seesaw balance actually so the glucagon the epinephrine the cortical and the tnf alpha that is the tumor necrosis factor alpha and certain medications uh, like exogenous glucocorticoids uh, and the vasopressors the lithium and the uh, usage of beta blockers and the overfeeding and intravenous uh, you uh, infusion of uh, dextrose uh, and the parenteral nutrition and the persistent bed rest uh, and increased uh, insulin resistance which is very commonly seen in uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus and uh, deficient insulin secretion which is a unique feature of uh, this particular type 1 uh, diabetes mellitus and coming to the factors that influence the hypoglycemia like uh, even without uh, the presence of diabetes also we find hypoglycemia it's a, it's a normal phenomena you don't think that uh, only the patients suffering from diabetes get into hypoglycemia even a normal person can get into hypoglycemia if he doesn't take any food for 24 hours or 8 hours or 16 hours he'll, his blood sugars will go down so the factors in the hospital setting which predispose to hypoglycemia they, they this is the one of the worst factors is the severe sepsis and uh, second is the trauma followed by stress and uh, the diabetes mellitus itself and uh, the prior insulin treatment might precipitate uh, hypoglycemia and prior glucocorticoid treatment also may precipitate hypoglycemia and the cardiovascular failure which leads to the peripheral circulatory failure pcf may lead to hypoglycemia and uh, one tries to go for uh, enthusiastic uh, intensive glucose control that is tight glucose control as we see in cases of type 1 diabetes mellitus and the young type 2 diabetes mellitus wherein we go for intensive glucose control 
and uh, they the, the in that particular uh, category we find uh, the patients uh, in hypoglycemia and next slide please thank you pravin and we can clearly see the pathogenesis of hyperglycemia in the hospital setting so this starts from the either the absolute or the relative insulin deficiency and uh, the increased counter regulatory hormones that's what we have discussed uh, the counter regulatory hormones are otherwise known as the stress hormones they are nothing but uh, adrenaline noradrenaline and the cortisol and the thyroid hormone and the growth hormone and the glucagon so this surge will the, the either the absolute or the relative insulin deficiency and uh, the increased uh, surge of counter regulatory hormones uh, will act at the level of adipose tissue will act at the level of liver will act at the level of muscle so thereby the adipose tissue it increases uh, the 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 lipolysis uh, and uh, which releases the free fatty acids and glycerol which in turn act on the at the level of liver and on the other side on the right hand side uh, these uh, the 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 uh, they, they act at the level of muscle and uh, it leads to the increased uh, protein breakdown and uh, that leads to the the amino acids and the lactates and again uh, the, the put together they act on the liver and which leads to the increased uh, glucose output and the increased glucogenolysis and uh, the factors which uh, determine this particular hyperglycemia is the basic factor is that the the absolute or relative insulin deficiency and the increased counter regulatory hormone surge which acts at the level of the adipose tissue and the liver and the muscle and that directly causes the hyperglycemia and the the muscle and it, it what it does is when when it is in the stress like it decreases the glucose utilization by the muscle and that leads to hyperglycemia and the other factors which contribute to hyperglycemia in the hospital setting on the left hand side you can see in the table the iv dextrose the glucocorticoids and the catecholamines and the inflammatory cytokines and the parenteral nutrition and the enteral nutrition so all these put together and one side this particular the the, the uh, protein breakdown and one side the increased lipolysis and the decreased uh, glucose utilization by the muscles and all these factors which i have mentioned they lead to hyperglycemia which leads to two effects like uh, the circulatory and the electrolyte effects and the tissue effects the circulatory and electrolyte uh, effects are uh, the volume depletion the hypoperfusion the electrolyte loss uh, the acid base disturbances and on the uh, second hand uh, the tissue effects uh, the reduced nitric oxide and superoxide generation and the endothelial dysfunction the platelet activation and the immune dysregulation and the mitochondrial injury these are all the deleterious and the hazardous effects of the hyperglycemia on the uh, the level of the circulatory and the electrolyte effects and the tissue effects and in turn both of them they lead to sepsis and the multi organ failure that is what we call it mods the multi organ dysfunction syndrome mods and finally the patient that the condition leads to death of the patient next slide please pravin yeah now we can see the this particular uh, the, the the circle shows the burden of hyperglycemia in non critical care setting and uh, the dark navy blue represents uh, the 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 percentage of diabetes and uh, the the light blue shows uh, the no diabetes so we we see this uh, the 40% of the people who are admitted in the uh, the, the non critical care setting in the hospital setting they have diabetes like 40% somewhere around say it's around some the incidence is 38 to 46 uh, so roughly put it as 40% they do suffer from this particular the the, the diabetes mellitus and uh, the other 60% they don't have the diabetes and approximately 38 to 46% of the non intensive care unit uh, hospitalized patients have diabetes mellitus either with or without a prior diagnosis 
that is sometimes we may miss the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and it is accidentally like diagnosed at the time of admission in the non-critical care setting or the critical care setting. Next slide please. And uh, this slide shows the economic impact of diabetes in India. These are all the direct costs actually. Like uh, see the hospitalization itself uh, uh, amounts to 35% of the costs uh, and the uh, monitoring and the lab is 22% uh, and the anti-diabetic drugs uh, that may include the insulin or the oral drugs whatever it may be it is around 17% uh, and the other drugs 3% uh, and uh, apart from the anti-diabetic drugs and the doctor visits uh, it is 12% uh, and the disposables and the consumables uh, 3% in India Diabetic patients spend annual direct cost of 35% on just hospitalization and it is a, an economical burden on the, uh, uh, the, the country's economy uh, in total. So next slide please. Yeah, now we can see the implications of hyperglycemia in non-critical care setting. And uh, the hyperglycemia in inpatients is associated with increased risk of uh, morbidity and mortality, surgical interventions, in-hospital infections, the surgical site infections, higher admission rates to the intensive care units and increased uh, hospital length of stay and uh, finally the increased uh, post-discharge care needs. So these are all the factors. Uh, where in the patient with hyperglycemia in inpatients is associated with the increased risk of see the, the, the very important thing is the increased risk of mortality is, is uh, the take home message here. Next slide please. And uh, we clearly see this uh, slide the barriers to glycemic control in a hospital they are categorized as the first part is diet, second part is medication and uh, the uh, physiological factors. Uh, coming to diet, uh, the variable meal times uh, and nothing by mouth, uh, that is NPO, nothing per oral orders before certain procedures and by the uh, treating clinician or physician or surgeon, whatever it may be, whoever it may be and uh, the use of uh, a enteral and the parenteral nutrition support. Uh, coming to the medications, uh, the concomitant drugs, uh, the, 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 they are the barriers uh, like maybe maybe the glucocorticoids and uh, maybe the drugs like lithium and uh, the, even these uh, the, the beta blockers and the ca cortisol and, uh, and the potential drug to drug interactions and uh, coming to the physiological factors uh, the acute illness plays a uh, vital role uh, and the physiological stress uh, and the impaired renal function that, that poses a threat to the treating clinician. So we have to be very meticulous in those conditions where the renal function is impaired. We have to be very cautious to so as to what drug is to be used and what drug is not to be used. So there are certain drugs which are not supposed to be used. Like the group uh, coming to the antibacterials, aminoglycoside group is absolutely contraindicated in the, the renally impaired uh, uh, patients. Likewise, uh, you have got uh, several contraindications uh, even even in the in the uh, armamentarium of uh, the, 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 the drugs uh, for type 2 diabetes also. And uh, uh, we can uh, the take home message here I would like to give is the insulin 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 is the only drug if at all you are dealing with diabetes in the impaired renal function in the hospital setting always you remember insulin is the drug of choice nothing other than in insulin next slide please now coming to our second part of agenda the principles of management next slide please yeah hyperglycemia is a correctable abnormality and thus is a therapeutic target to improve outcomes in hospitalized patients this is the take home message actually See, I repeat once again, hyperglycemia is a correctable abnormality if the, if the treating clinician knows how to uh, control hyperglycemia and the methods to control hyperglycemia in a, in, a, in a proper way, it's a correctable abnormality and thus is a therapeutic 
target to improve the outcomes in the hospitalized patients. So if you can tackle this hyperglycemia properly, probably you would reduce the morbidity and mortality. That is the greatest advantage uh, the, the patient has if you, the clinician is wise and intelligent. Next slide, please. So this uh, slide uh, clearly says about uh, the in-hospital management of hyperglycemia and the objectives being uh, first one is to restore a stable glycemia that is maintain uh, euglycemia and minimize the disruption of the metabolic state and the minimize the adverse outcomes and shorten the hospital stay and reduce the readmission and improve the patient outcomes. So these are the objectives in front of the, uh, the treating clinician. So next slide please. And uh, coming to this slide, uh, the managing hyperglycemia in the non-critical condition involves uh, the systematic evaluation of the glycemic status and uh, setting of the glycemic target and providing uh, therapeutic interventions. Next slide please. And uh, this slide shows the targets, the glycemic targets for the hospitalized patient and uh, according to the American Diabetes Association 2021, even the 2022 guidelines have come, they also say the same from the 2021 as well as the 2022 guidelines. The target being, uh, the target glucose range is, is not changed from the earlier one, it is always uh, like uh, a fixed one in between 140 milligram per deciliter to 180 milligram deci per milligrams per deciliter and the target of 110 to 140 milligram of deciliter may be appropriate if this can be achieved without a significant hypoglycemia that is if the patient doesn't if the patient doesn't get into uh, hypoglycemia you can go for a strict control in the even in the hospitalized patient with a target of 110 to 140 and in general it is 140 to 180. Higher glucose ranges may be acceptable in terminally ill patients and severe comorbidities or the, 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 the elderly patients and when the close nursing supervision is not feasible. So this is about the, the recommendations of uh, the American Diabetes Association 2021 as well as the 2022 and even the earlier uh, the recommendations also were the same. There is no change in that. And coming to our own uh, Indian uh, uh, organization that is RSSDI, that is the Research Society for the Study of Diabetes in India, what it says is the level of care, if the patient is in uh, the intensive care unit, uh, you maintain as per the, the, the ADA, uh, it says uh, maintain the glycemic target in between 140 to 180 milligram per deciliter. And if it is non-ICU uh, setting, the fasting must be maintained in between 80 to 120 milligram per deciliter and the pre-meal less than 140 milligram per deciliter and post-meal less than 180 milligram per deciliter. So it, it more or less it says uh, somewhere around some 140 to 180 is reasonable whether the patient is in the ICU setup or in the non-ICU setup and if the patient as uh, no tendency to get into hypoglycemia, you can try a, a target of 110 to 140 milligrams per deciliter of blood glucose. So the uh, finally the inference is threshold for starting insulin is if the blood glucose is around or more than 180 milligram per deciliter in the hospitalized patient, it is mandatory that uh, you should start uh, Insulin. Next slide, please. Yeah, and the various ways of managing hyperglycemia in the hospital, and uh, it is divided like uh, the like the anti-hyperglycemic therapy, and uh, the 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 uh, left hand side you find uh, insulin, which is highly and highly recommended. It is almost mandatory, and uh, OADs are not recommended not generally recommended but i say it is absolutely contraindicated so forget about oral drugs in the uh, management of uh, hyperglycemia in the 
uh, hospital setting as inpatient setting so the only uh, 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 leftover option is insulin and it is very very strongly recommended and the level of evidence is a and the and the and uh, it is categorized as if you can manage to go for uh, the intravenous insulin the critical ill patients in the icu it's well and good if you cannot do that uh, non critical ill patients and if you are not able to if you don't have skills to maintain the iv insulin even in the critical ill patients or the non critical ill patients always you can go for the subcutaneous insulin that's what if you can maintain the you know the art of maintaining the iv insulin it's always preferred uh, to this particular subcutaneous insulin when it matters with the, the things are related to the critical ill patients in the in, in the, the intensive care unit setting next slide please so coming to the last part of our uh, uh, my talk the basal bolus therapy uh, as an optimal uh, regimen next slide please next slide please pravin thank you thank you so much and uh, coming to this uh, the basal bolus regimen see basal bolus regimen is nothing but uh, it's a combination of uh, the basal insulin and the combination of three prandial insulins see this is uh, uh, just it is it is designed to mimic the normal physiological secretion of the normal pancreas that is uh, normal pancreas in the, in the normal human beings uh, it it produces the the basal insulin round the clock uh, 24 hours that is uh, 1 to 2 units per hour that is that is that depends from person to person that is intrapersonal and the interpersonal variation is there so from 24 to 48 units uh, sometimes 50 52 units are also produced by the pancreas depending upon the needs of that particular uh, individual not patient uh, see i am talking about uh, the normal physiological secretion of the insulin by the beta cells of the uh, pancreas so they all the time it, it 24 hours there is a basal secretion and uh, when you eat and then only pancreas produces insulin in uh, in proportion to the quantity what you have taken see god's creation is such uh, such a great uh, thing that uh, like it it measures the calories and all the carbohydrates proteins and the and the fats and it measures it so exactly and so accurately after you eat suppose you have your breakfast so it it automatically releases the desired quantities of the prandial insulin so after lunch also the same thing after dinner also even you take a cup of coffee depending upon that it, 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 it produces some four or five units which is equivalent to that particular calories of that coffee or tea so this is uh, the, the normal physiological secretion we try to mimic the normal physiological secretion but only we differ in one point uh, that the normal pancreas uh, which is which is created by the the omnipotent omnipresent god uh, that delivers the prandial insulin after the intake of our food uh, whereas we are going to deliver our insulin the prandial insulin prior to taking the food uh, either uh, you can you can uh, the, see the difference uh, even the biphasic human uh, premixed insulins uh, they they have to be taken half an hour prior to the meal whereas the analogs uh, the designer insulins are uh, the co formulations have come they have to be taken just uh, just prior to the meals so 5 minutes prior to the meal you can take uh, and uh, even even you miss the uh, insulin in between also you remember you can take that still it works even after the meal is over then you remember that okay you have forgotten your insulin even in that case also you can take that insulin it works the only difference between the the designer analog and the 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 uh, co-formulations and the human insulins is that uh, the human insulins the insulin is always uh, the in the in vitro it is it is present in the hexamer hexamer has to break down into a diamer diamer has to break down into a monomer monomeric insulin is the active principle of the insulin this biodegradation from hexamer to diamer to monomer takes around 30 minutes that is the reason why we have to wait for 
at least 30 minutes before taking the either the regular insulin or the the biphasic premixed insulin when it comes to the human insulins when it comes to the the insulin analogs uh, the the, the ra ra rapid acting that is uh, like uh, the the insulin uh, aspect the insulin lispro the insulin glulysin or the uh, the, 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 the 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 insulins uh, they, they can be taken just uh, prior to the meals uh, or 5 minutes prior to the meal and uh, even in between the meal also we can take even post meal also we take it works and when it comes to the long acting insulins like uh, the the glargen or the glargen u100 or glargen e300 or the deglutec the the the, the best basal insulin on the earth the deglutec and all and uh, uh, the, these are the designer insulins and the co-formulation is nothing but uh, insulin deglutec and aspect uh, if it is taken just prior to the meal it is uh, sufficient because all these designer insulins are the, the, the analogs are the co-formulations they are already in the form of the, the monomeric uh, 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 form uh, that is the, the, the uh, 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 actual uh, the insulin that, that, that works very instantly and uh, the physiological way of glycemic control which is recommended in the hospital and uh, it addresses three components the basal bolus regimen is going to address the three components the basal fasting basal component of it uh, the, 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 that is uh, for the fasting state insulin requirement uh, and the bolus that is for the meal time insulin requirement uh, and the correctional is uh, unexpected glucose elevations, uh, the excursions or dispose of the elevated hyperglycemia. And uh, this improves the glycemic control with uh, fewer hyperglycemic uh, and the hypoglycemic episodes because all the time we see the sphinx, uh, the extremes we see, like uh, the, the patient will be uh, 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 in hypoglycemia in the night uh, or early in the morning, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, we see the patient in 40 and uh, post breakfast uh, it will be 400 so the, the abnormal excursions that is the the abnormal hyperglycemia or the hypoglycemia from 40 to 400 uh, is very much minimized uh, with this particular basal bolus regimen next slide please yeah now coming to the sliding scale insulin and uh, it is time to leave it behind see now no international uh, organization recommends sliding scale insulin and including uh, the American Diabetes Mel Mel the American Diabetes Association uh, way back in 2019 has said you have to discourage this is the time uh, you have to discourage this sliding scale insulin see that's going to uh, give you this uh, the, the, the erratic blood sugars that is either the 400 or the 40 slow so sliding scale insulin it is time to leave it behind even even the earlier harrison's uh, principles of uh, the eternal medicine the textbooks said uh, sliding scale can be followed but after the 19th uh, edition has come even the 20th edition has come the latest one is 20th edition the harrison's principles of internal medicine even you take this uh, the jocelyn textbook of diabetes even the pickup and williams textbook of diabetes even you take this, uh, the Williams, uh, the, the, the latest edition, uh, uh, the textbook of endocrinology, all this, they discourage this sliding scale insulin because of the following reasons. Like, uh, this is non-physiological with retrospective reaction to blood glucose levels and poor glycemic control and increased risks of hypoglycemia. Either it produces hyperglycemia or the hypoglycemia we cannot calculate the dose with this sliding scale insulin and it promotes uh, uh, the glucose roller coaster effect and cannot uh, predict insulin dosage requirements and this is not individualized and uh, this is something like a, a reactive approach practice rather than the proactive what what is uh, required is the proactive approach is required uh, but this uh, sliding scale is reactive approach practice so we should uh, discourage this reactive approach practice and we should uh, adopt uh, this particular proactive uh, practices so these are the 
the side effects of this particular uh, sliding scale insulin and uh, it is high time that we should avoid and at any cost so we, we have to avoid because sliding scale insulin has different different scales for regular insulin short acting insulin or the analogs like lispro it has got one scale for aspart it has got one scale for gla basal insulin glargin it has one scale and the the degludeg it has one scale and still even in the the even we we discard sliding scale insulin in our uh, inpatient settings but still in the most advanced countries like the united states of america and even in the uk also and majority of the physicians and the clinicians and the diabetologists and the endocrinologists they are still following this sliding scale insulin which should be like discarded it's high time we have to leave this behind and go with this basal bolus insulin regimen next slide please yeah this is uh, a graph showing the basal bolus versus the sliding scale of the insulin where is in the, in the left hand side you can see this the 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 bold uh, is uh, the, the the bold blue is uh, this is uh, the the basal bolus insulin and uh, the the uh, the uh, hollow circle blue circle represents the sliding scale insulin so you can very clearly see that uh, with the sliding scale insulin you can never uh, reach the euglycemia whereas with the basal bolus insulin it clearly shows that uh, it is up to the mark it is somewhere in between 140 uh, 130 or the maximum 150 or 160 so this is the the comparison between this and uh, and the, this is uh, and the via y axis you can see the blood glucose and on the x axis you can see the days of therapy and the changes in the blood glucose concentrations in patients treated with basal bolus regimen and on the right hand side uh, you can see that uh, the 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 there is a demarcating line uh, the the uh, interrupted dotted line uh, and prior to that it is uh, the the sliding scale insulin and after that uh, the the basal bolus regime how nicely it has gone down how it nicely it has taken down the blood glucose levels to the normal c that is the same the the days of therapy on the x axis and the blood glucose on the right axis the glycemic control rapidly improves after the switching to a basal bolus insulin regimen the target uh, glycemia is achieved uh, that is the blood glucose of less than 140 mg per deciliter and the basal bolus regime 66% of the patients uh, were able to get back to normalcy whereas with uh, sliding scale insulin only 38% of the patients were able to reach the target so basal uh, bolus insulin regimen is uh, preferred over uh, this particular uh, are uh, the uh, sliding scale insulin in the management of non critically ill hospitalized patients with uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus so next slide please and uh, coming to the dosing like uh, the, the basal bolus uh, uh, the dose of the ba ba basal bolus insulin in non critical uh, calculating the ta total daily dose uh, that is from intravenous insulin to subcutaneous insulin we need to switch over from intravenous to subcutaneous basal bolus insulin the insulin requirements of the last 6 hours of stable control of blood glucose multiply that with 4 that gives the total daily dose and the total daily dose uh, in the insulin naive patients uh, that is uh, the the ideal body weight the patients uh, the, the the insulin naive patients that is the the type 1 patients are typed uh, mostly the type 2 patients whose uh, the body is uh, maintained ideally that is they maintain the ideal body weight and the ideal body mass index that is less than 23.5 uh, uh, kilograms per meter square and we generally start the total daily dose will be 0.4 to 0.5 units per kilogram body weight uh, in uh, 24 hours in divided doses and uh, if it is in the case of obese uh, we tend to go for little higher doses because uh, as per the 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 uh, their obesity the, the the body mass is uh, large and we go for 0.5 to 0.6 units per kilogram 
uh, in 24 hours in divided doses and uh, when it comes to the lean or renally impaired uh, we uh, uh, down titrate the insulin uh, total daily dose uh, to 0.3 to 0.4 uh, units uh, per kilogram body weight in 24 hours in divided uh, doses. Next slide please. Yeah, thank you. And uh, dosing uh, the basal bolus in the non-critical care. These are all the steps. How to calculate uh, this particular uh, basal bolus uh, dosing in the non-critical care. First of all, you have to calculate the total daily dose which is called TDD. And divide uh, the total daily dose equally uh, like 50% must be the bolus component. 50% must be the basal component. That is... 50-50, you, you remember this, 50-50, the rule of 50-50 as far as the, the deciding the dosage of basal bolus. Suppose, suppose you had, you are, you are t total daily dose is 30 units. You divide it like into two halves, 15 and 15. 15 will be basal insulin and the 15 will be bolus. Again, bolus is all the time, three times. So, 15 divided by 3 becomes 5. So, 5 units of this uh, the insulin aspect, the insulin glulysin, the insulin lyspro, three times a day with a uh, basal insulin. Let it be the insulin degludec or whatever it may be. And the bolus insulin is divided equally between the three major meals. That's what I said. And measure the blood glucose four times a day, three pre meals and one at bedtime. And measure insulin sensitivity. And based on the blood glucose measurement, and insulin sensitivity add the correctional insulin to basal to the bolus insulin and last is based on the fasting plasma glucose titrate the basal insulin see all the time the fasting plasma glucose gives you the the, the approximate quantity of the, the units that is required as far as the basal insulin is concerned whereas the prandial the bolus is related to the the prandial shots, that is the, the post meal, the post lunch and the post breakfast, the post lunch, post dinner, that gives you the, the, the dosage for the prandial insulin. Whereas the, the fasting gives you the, the how much basal insulin has to be uh, 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 used in that particular scenario. Yeah, this is regarding the uh, dosage method uh, uh, with regards to the basal bolus in the non-critical care. Next slide please. And this is the uh, ch chart showing the correctional insulin protocol and it is divided the blood glucose from 100 to 140, 141 to 180, 181 to 220, 221 to 260, 260 to 300, 300 to like 350 and 351 to 400 and more than 400. And uh, on the left hand and the right hand side it is categorized as the usual in between the insulin sensitive patients on the left hand side and the insulin resistant patients on the right hand side. You just remember this usual dose will be like 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 and if the patient is insulin sensitive reduce 2 units from the usual dose and if the patient is insulin resistant add 2 units that is. So suppose 141 to 180 the usual insulin is 4 units. And if it is insulin sensitive, reduce 2 from that, it becomes 2 and add 2, that becomes 6 and insulin resistant. Whereas, like you can see that uh, if it is more than 400, uh, the usual dose is 16 uh, and minus 2 will be insulin sensitive 14 and plus 2, 18 will be in the cases of insulin resistant. You can go through this, uh, uh, the beautiful table uh, they, they, which, uh, which gives you the correctional insulin protocol. Correctional insulin protocol is always to, uh, to tackle the, the uh, extra load that is the, 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 the above the normalcy if you find the blood glucose what we give is called the correctional insulin. Next slide please. And I think we have come to the summary and uh, this is the important take home message and uh, the optimum glycemic control is associated with improved hospital outcomes. In general, 
Insulin is the preferred treatment for hyperglycemia in hospitalized patients with diabetes and basal bolus therapy is the choice for management of hyperglycemia in non critical care setting and uh, thank you so much and uh, uh, i hand over uh, uh, the session to my next speaker dr sepuri tirumala devi